I'm glad that you're here this uh, morning. Welcome all those that are visiting with us, and certainly glad that you're here. Encourage everyone to get their Bible out and to follow along as we study together. Take everything that is said and compare it back to the Scriptures to see if it's true. If you've got a question about anything, then feel free to ask that when services are over, and we'll seek to give a Bible answer to that. If we find them to be true, then that we'll take and use those and make application of those principles to our lives. You know, the book of James is a unique book in the New Testament. It's a book about living one's faith. There's not really a lot that we would consider to be doctrinal in the book of James. It's not like the book of Romans where the first ten chapters are designed to uh, talk about the fact that we're justified by faith and, and, and establish that fact, but rather it gets right in to how we live our daily lives. In fact, a good key verse for the book of James is the one that Mark just read for us in James 1 and verse 22, where James said, But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourself. That is that God expects us not to be mere listeners to God's word, but to be individuals that actually put it into practice in our lives. Our faith, as James would say in James 2, is to be a faith that works. That is a faith that obeys. And this morning I want to focus in on that section of verses from James 1, verses 19 through verse 27, where James really talks about being a doer of the word. Three points we want to look at this morning. Number one, we want to talk about the Word of God as it's described here in James chapter 1. Number two, we want to talk about the one that's a hear only and what James says about him. And then finally, we'll talk about the one that is a doer of the Word. But let's begin by talking about the Word of God that James describes here in James chapter 1. James, in describing the Word of God, said that he who ever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it. That phrase tells me a number of things about the word of God that's important for you and I to understand. Number one, it tells me that God's word is a law. You know, there are many people that sort of don't like the idea of thinking of God's word as a law. In fact, they misunderstood, I believe, some of the passages that are found in the Word of God, like Romans 6 and verse 14, where the Bible said, Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And they take that to mean that we're not under a law of, of, of any kind. And that's not what Paul's saying in Romans chapter 6. I take Paul to be saying, we're not under a law system that requires perfect obedience in order to be justified, but whether we're under a system where God has extended grace unto mankind. But that passage does not mean that we're not under a law of any kind. In fact, this isn't the only Bible passage that describes the New Testament as being a law. You have a passage in the book of Galatians chapter 6 and in verse 2 where the apostle Paul said, Brethren, if any man is overtaken in a trespass... You that are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so the Bible speaks of this law of Christ. Not only in Galatians chapter 6 and Romans chapter 8 and verse 2, the Bible tells us that there is therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to he said to the law of the flesh, but according to the law of the spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus. And so there's a law of spirit of life that is found in Christ Jesus. There is what Paul would fall in Romans 13 and verse 10, the law of love. And so over and over again, the Bible describes the New Testament as being a law. And I wonder sometimes if people that say, well, we're not under a law of any kind if they really realize that if there was no law, there would be no sin, and therefore Jesus isn't needed at all. In fact, you know what sin is? We talked about this a couple of weeks ago in the book of 1 John. Sin is a transgression of the law. You can't break a law, you can't transgress a law, unless there is a law. 
And that's why the Apostle Paul made the point in Romans 4 and verse 15 that when there is no law, there is no sin. By the way, why would somebody not want to refer to God's word as a law? Because that very definition of the idea of a law suggests something that is binding, something we have to keep, something we have to obey, something that is not optional. And so they don't like to refer to it as a law or think of it in that way because that means then they'd have to keep and follow it. remember having a discussion one time with a a relative who was arguing about that, that we're not under law. And I referred to all of these passages They talked about the law of Christ and the perfect law of liberty. And he finally came back and he said, I know what those passages say, but I don't like to think of it as a law. I know why he didn't want to think of it as a law, because then that meant he had to keep it. The word of God is a law. But not only is it a law, the Bible describes it as the perfect law of liberty. That is, it is a law with which there are no flaws. I don't know about you, but when it comes to the laws of our land, I can find some flaws in some of those laws. They're not perfect because they're given by imperfect men. But when we think about the Word of God, not only is it a law, it is a perfect law. In Psalm 19 and in verse 7, the psalmist said, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. God's law is perfect. It is complete. It is lacking in nothing. There are no flaws in that law. Why is it perfect? Well, it's perfect law, number one, because it is given by a perfect God. That is, these words that we study, oftentimes we'll say, Peter said, or Paul said, or James said. But it's important that while we understand those human authors wrote those books, that in reality, they are God's words. In 2 Timothy 3 and 16, it said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped unto every good work. Really what that passage tells me is two things. Number one, the Bible is a divine product. This is the word of God. Paul commended the brethren at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 because when he came and preached among them, he said, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God that also effectively works in you that believe. And so it is a perfect law because it's God's law and it came from a perfect God. And that perfect God gave me everything that I need. Have you ever, maybe those that are in school, May remember you'd go to buy a book and then the teacher might say, well, now you need this supplement too. And so you had to get the supplement. And in other words, this doesn't provide everything you need. You need something else in addition to that. And oftentimes in life, when people are selling us stuff, there's things like that you need this, but then you also need this. And maybe you need to buy this as well. But when we think about the word of God, here's Paul's point. It gives me everything I need. I don't have to go to another source. In fact, it gives me all things that pertain unto life and unto godliness. There's not a single thing that I need to know to serve God, a single instruction that I need to hear that's not contained in the Bible. In fact, going back to that passage in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it thoroughly equips us into every good work. It tells me what uh, I need to know is proper for doctrine, for proof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. As we sum that up, you could probably say it with me. It tells me what is right. It tells me what is not right. It tells me how to get right, and it tells me how to stay right. What else do I need that's not provided in this law of liberty? So when I think about the Word of God, what I'm looking into, he said it's a law. Not only is it a law, it's a perfect law, but not only is it a perfect law, it is a law of liberty. Maybe sometimes the reason people don't like to think about the word of God as a law is to think of a law somehow as being oppressive. And yet what the uh, brother of our Lord says is it's a law that gives freedom. It is a law of liberty. (coughs) How is it a law of liberty? Well, sin uh, puts us in bondage. Whoever commits sin, the Bible says, is a slave of sin. 
Uh, when we become servants of sin, we are put into slavery, and we want to be set free. Well, what offers us that freedom? It is the Word of God. Galatians chapter 5, and in verse 1, the Christians that Paul was writing to at Galatia were contemplating going back to part of the old law. In fact, Paul reminds them there in Galatians chapter 4, or Galatians chapter 5, if you want to take part of the law, you're going to have to take the whole thing. But before he made that point, he said in verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. In other words, Christ offers us freedom. We are free from the law, sin, and death, Romans chapter 8 and verse 2. There's no condemnation now to those that are in Christ Jesus. Well, why not? Why is there no, no, no condemnation? For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from what? The law of sin and death. So it's a law, but it is a law that when we follow that law, it offers us liberty. And so here that one statement that is made here, whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty, it tells me it's a law, it's a perfect law, and it is a law that gives me freedom. But there's something else I learn about God's word in this particular passage. That is not only is it a perfect law that it makes me complete, I also learn from this that it is a word that we are to take and that we are to uh, take it and listen to it because it can save our soul. Look at verse 21. James chapter 1 here, and in verse 21. And what James says here is that we are to take this word and lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness. By the way, the idea of receiving with meekness is the idea that we receive it to obey it. We submit to it. We receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. This word is able to offer us salvation. In fact, do you know why Paul said he wasn't ashamed of the gospel? Why is it that Paul would go out and preach the gospel message even though it brought persecution? Even though it ultimately cost his life? He said, because I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it's the power of God to what? To salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18 the Bible said the message of the, of the gospel, the message of the cross, is foolishness to those that are perishing. You, you preach this message, you share the word of God. You know how the world responds to that sometimes? They did, that's foolishness. The message of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing, but to those that are being saved, it is the power to salvation. It's the power to save. And so this word, why am I looking into it? Well, because it's perfect. It's God's law. It can save my soul and it can give me liberty from sin. But to do that, this word needs to be implanted. In in the book of James chapter 1 and verse 21, he said we are to receive with meekness the implanted word. What does that mean? It means as powerful as this word is, as much as this word can do for me, it doesn't do any of those things unless I allow it to take root in my heart. That's the point. Where is it planted? It's planted in my heart. You, you remember the parable of the soils in the book of Luke chapter 8, 11 to 15? You've got all kinds of, of different soils that are there. Some are rocky ground and the word never penetrates it. Some is, is shallow ground and it, it, and it just barely takes root. And then the sun comes out and it withers away. Some's among the thorns. But you know who the good word is? The good word or the good heart is the one that when that word of God is planted, you know what it does? It takes root in the heart. It's implanted. It becomes part of them. It is that they're keeping that word with all diligence. That word is hid in their heart as the psalmist said in Psalm 119. And so this word is a powerful word. It's the law of God, but it has to become engrafted into my heart. And one of the points James is making here in James chapter 1 is that if we're not careful, we confuse the hearing of that word for the word actually becoming implanted in our hearts. And so James, after describing this word, he describes the man that is a hearer only. Could that describe you? I mean, it may describe us sometimes more closely than we really want to admit, but here's a man that James describes him. Look at James 1 and verse 22. He is self-deluded. What does that mean? He deceives himself. How does he deceive himself? 
He confuses hearing the word with doing the word of God. He thinks he's sanctified because he heard the gospel preached. He hears it. He's present at services or he reads the Bible and then he deceives himself and says, because I was there and I heard Bible class, because I was there and I heard the sermon, or because I read my Bible today, everything is fine. But he's deceiving himself because he doesn't take any of that and put it actually into action. In fact, what he fails to understand is that hearing alone is not enough. Hearing only increases our responsibility. In the book of 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, the Lord said it would be better for him not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment uh, delivered to them. He's describing there the individuals that have heard the truth and now they've drifted from it. And he said it would have been better for him not to have known it. Why? Because now that he knows it and he's rejected it, what do you appeal to him with? His responsibility is only increased. In fact, in, in, in the book of 1 John chapter 2 and in verse 4, John said, He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. The one that knows but doesn't do and yet says, I'm okay, John said he's a liar. That's what James said, he is self, he is self-deceived. We need something else about this here only that is described here in James chapter 1 that may hit close to home, and that is, he is a religious man. We're not talking in James chapter 1 about people in the world that are living immoral lives. James seems to be very squarely talking about people in the body of Christ. And he describes him down in verse 26. If anyone among you thinks he's religious and does not bridle his own tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Guy Woods defined this word religious as piety that manifests itself outwardly. It's external devotion. Now, here's a person that on the outside sometimes appears to be religious. He's the person that is at every service, maybe many times. He's the person that is present during the gospel meetings and hears the word of God preached. And yet, he's described here as an individual that does not actually put that word of God into practice and so it doesn't do him any good at all. I think about the, the Pharisees of Matthew chapter 23 who pay tithes of anise and mint and cumin. If you looked at them, they appeared very religious as they sat down and they counted out a tenth of their anise and their mint and their cumin and all those spices, and yet they neglected the weightier matters of the law. And in fact, the Lord describes them later on as they appeared to be righteous outwardly, but inwardly they were like that grave that's full of dead men's bones. The hearer only, what he, he's self-deceived. That means he feels very comfortable with where he is. If you ask him, how are you in your standing before God, he's very comfortable with where he is. He's a religious man that goes through the outward actions, but that is the extent of it. Not only does he go through the outward actions, he is a forgetful man. He has a memory problem. He looks into the perfect law of liberty, the Bible says here in James chapter 1, but he immediately forgets what he saw. Look at verse 24. He observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. He, here's a man that has a memory problem. He hears, but there's no application of the message. You know, this morning if somebody came in and their hair was all messed up and tie was crooked and, you know, their face was dirty. And you ask them about it. And you say, you know what, I looked in the mirror and I saw that and I forgot all about it. We might be concerned about that individual. We might think, well, they need to, they, they've got a memory problem that they would look and see and then turn around and forget what they saw and come out looking that way. And, you know, what James's point is, that's how people oftentimes do the word of God. I mean, for example, let's just talk about our Bible class this morning. We might talk about the home. And we can talk about the home. Here's what the forgetful hearer does. He answers his Bible class lessons. He, 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 asks, he may even make a comment in class about it, well, how the husband ought to treat the wife. And yet, then when the doors are opened and amen is said, he gets up and he leaves and he forgets all about what has been said and it doesn't have any impact on how he treats his wife on Monday through Saturday. 
Doesn't affect what kind of uh, what kind of parent he is on Monday through Saturday. He is somebody that is forgetful. He never takes that word and he never puts it into practice in his life. Matthew chapter twenty one. You may remember in Matthew chapter twenty one. And in verses 28 through verse 32, do you remember the, the parable of the two sons? You have the two sons that the father called. He said, I want you to go work in my vineyard. And one of them said, I go. He's the guy that would shout amen. He had, he's the one that would give the right answer. And then, you know what he did? He didn't go. He's a hearer only. He's not a doer. On the other hand, you have a man here that was the, the first son, or the, the, the other son that said, I will not. And the Bible said later he regretted it or he repented and he went. He underwent the change. That brought my wife, all, all the negative things that may have been said about how he first answered, he became ultimately a doer of the word. In fact, the doer of the word is one that is forgetful. I don't have this passage on the chart, but you know, one of the first songs we, we teach our young kids in Bible class, we sing in, in vacation Bible school, is about the wise man that built his house on the rock. Do you know who the wise man is? Versus the foolish man. The foolish man, Jesus said, is whoever hears these sayings of mine and what? Does not do them. It makes us a fool. It makes us a fool to hear and then not do. Here is a quote from C. Jordan in the pulpit commentary. And I think he, he probably says it well. When he says, Some, when the service is over, seldom think of anything but going home. Others will pass a remark about the sermon and then dismiss the subject finally from their thoughts. A few will express more deliberately the pleasure with which they listen to the discourse, but perhaps even these are satisfied merely with having enjoyed it. The purpose of preaching, however, is not that people may be very much pleased, but that they may be profited, edified, and inspired to live an upright, generous, godly life. The highest praise that can be stowed upon a Christian minister is not to tell him how much his preaching is enjoyed on Sabbath, that's obviously a denominational quote there, but to let him see how well it is being translated into the life on the other days of the week. We live in a practical age, and the mission of the pulpit is as practical and definite as that of any other institution of our time. It is an agency for man building. Its work is to promote the doing of the word of God in the everyday lives of men. Those people, therefore, are the victims of a miserable self-deception who regard hearing as the sum of Christian duty. Such persons have no idea of the nature of true piety. Their profession is nothing better than an empty form. They may be strictly orthodox in doctrine, evangelical in sentiment, but, it does the, but what does this profit if their church going carries with it little power to direct their daily lives in the ways of holiness? A theologian is not necessarily a Christian. The hearer only is on the road to final spiritual ruin. I think he says it well. Could that be your eye? that we look at ourselves and we could be just simply the hearer only. He could even be the one that delivers the message, but he's the one that's the hearer only. He's self-deceived, he's very religious, but all that religion that he does is useless. It's void, it's vain. This one's religion is of no value. So we have the word of God. Because I gave you a perfect law. It's a law of liberty, it'll save your soul. You've got to get it implanted in your heart. But don't be that person that is merely content with hearing. He is self-deceived. It is useless to him that he is religious because it doesn't translate into how he lives his daily life. Instead, you and I want to be the doer of the word. What is the doer of the word? When we think about this doer of the word, how would we describe him here in this text? Number one, the doer of the word is one that looks into the word of God and sees his faults. In other words, maybe I could put it, should have put it this way. He views the study of the Word of God as an exercise to improve himself, not merely an academic exercise. In other words, when he studies the Word of God, it is not merely about coming to an understanding of the Word of God, but it's about then taking that Word and making himself a better person by that Word. He, so he looks into the law of liberty. Look at verse 25. 
and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer of the word, but he, uh, he said, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. In other words, he's looking into the word of God in order to make himself better. Do you remember 1 Corinthians chapter 14? It's a, it is a chapter that is first and primarily, I believe, about there being order in the assembly. And it is dealing with the time of spiritual gifts, but uh, there were those that were really exercising the gift of tongues in the assembly. And that seemed to be the one that everybody was excited about. And it prophecy sort of took a back seat to, to tongue speaking. And the Apostle Paul is pointing out in 1 Corinthians 14 that prophecy, not tongue speaking, is what was really needed. Well, why? Look at verse 24. But if all prophesy, that means they were all relating the word of God. That's what prophecy was teaching the word of God, the inspiration. An unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in and is convinced by all, and he's judged by all. What's the purpose of the preaching? The purpose is that when they hear that, it then convicts and convinces them, and thus the secrets of the heart are revealed, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. In other words, when that word is preached, the, the unbeliever, if he's a, an honest hearer, it convicts him, it judges him, and it exposes what he needs to to do in his life. Isn't that what the Word of God does for us all? How do you view the Word of God? Is it merely something I've got to have Bible class done? I've got to, I've got to read my Bible every day? Or do you look at the Word of God to expose what needs to be changed, to convict you of sin, to judge your heart so that now I know here's an area that I need to improve in? In Romans chapter 7 and verse 7, Sin tells us what is wrong. I mean, the law tells us what sin is. Paul's talking about the old law in that verse. But he said, I would not have known that covetous was sin. I'm summing up what Paul said. Except the law said you shall not sin. You know how I know what's right and what's wrong? Do You know how I know what I need to be doing? It's found in the word of God. And so the doer of the word is one that when he comes in, he sets, whether it's in Bible class or in a sermon or whether he's reading his Bible on his own in his home, he's looking into it to see where he needs to make improvements. Is that how you study the Word? Is that how I study the Word of God? But then not only is the doer one that looks in the law of liberty with self-examination, but he's one that then acts on what he hears. He becomes swift to hear and slow to speak and slow to wrath, verse 19. And, and, and many believe, by the way, he's, he's talking about our attitude toward God in that passage. That he's saying, I'm quick to hear God's word. I don't argue with what God's word says. I don't get angry about what God's word says. But now that I've become exposed to it, I'm going to learn to accept it. I'm swift to hear it. I don't make excuses. The doer doesn't make excuses. We're going to talk tonight about King Saul. And King Saul was an excuse maker. When he saw something was wrong, when his sin was exposed, there was always an excuse. A doer's not that way. A doer of the word becomes swift to listen. He then takes that word and he lays aside, in verse 21, all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Whatever sin is exposed, you know what he says, I'm going to take and I'm going to lay that aside. When he, he's then going to bridle his tongue. When he learns about the tongue and what he needs to say, he's going to put a bridle on it. He's going to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. That's involved in pure and undefiled religion. And he's going to keep himself unspotted from the world. You know what all those things have to do? He's looked into God's word and now he's going to act on it. He's going to put that into practice in his life. And what happens is this man, that person, you know what's how he's going to be? He's going to be blessed by God. Look at verse 25. James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and in verse 25. Here's what James said in talking about this, this doer. He said, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it. Not just here and there, but he continues in it. And is not a forgetful hearer. But a doer of the word, this one will be blessed in what he does. How's he going to be blessed? Look at John 13 and verse 17. If you know these things, blessed are ye if what? You do them. He's blessed because he's obeying. He's, God's obedience to God's word always brings blessing. Hebrews 5 and verse 9. And having been perfected, 
he became the author of eternal salvation to who? To all that hear him? No. To all that feel comfortable with where they are? No. But to he that, what, obeys him. Here is the person that takes and he obeys. You remember Matthew chapter 7? There are a lot of self-deceived people in this world. And Matthew chapter 7, 21 to 23 tells me that. Because Jesus said in the picture in the judgment day that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does what? But he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. It's a simple path. James is a simple book. There are books that we study of the Bible that are hard books. We finish Isaiah. We think about Revelation. They take a lot of... Uh, of effort to, uh, to study and to understand completely what's being said. James is not a book like that. James is a simple, simple book about living one's faith. And before James really gets into the specifics about how do I control my tongue? What about a faith that works? How, how do I treat my fellow man? Before he gets into all those specifics, he just reminds his readers that you've got a perfect law, but that perfect law is useless if all you're going to do is listen to it and shout amen and then walk away. It only helps you if you're a doer of the word. And here's the thing. You or I are in James 1. We are in that passage somewhere. The question is, which one are you? You're here this morning, and so which one are you? Are you the hearer only that is deceiving yourself? Or are you the doer of the word? And each one of us needs to examine and answer that question for ourselves. It could be that there's somebody here present this morning that's not yet become a Christian, though, and you're determined this morning you want to put that into practice. You want to act on that word, and you can do that by hearing the Lord, the gospel preached, believing in Jesus as the Son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Jesus, and then being buried in the waters of baptism. And when you do that, your sins be washed away. Then walk in God's word. Continue in that perfect law of liberty, and you will be blessed in what you do. Or it could be that there's somebody here this morning that's obeyed the gospel. But now when you open up the, the perfect law of liberty and you look into it, you realize there are mistakes that you've made. There's things you've done you shouldn't do. Maybe things that you should have done that you haven't done. If that's something that requires a public acknowledgement, we'll assist you in doing that. If it's between you and the Lord, then you can ask him to forgive you. And then you can determine from now on, I want to seek to be a doer of the word. No matter what your need is, if you have anything that needs to be corrected this morning, why not do it right now? As together we stand and we sing.